Welcome to the Growing Faber Beans in 2019 webinar. My name is Prue Cook and I work with the Birchett Cropping Group and I also coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the Southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profit profitability opportunities. And the purpose of today's webinar is to give new and existing bean growers a snappy overview of what to consider this season to set yourselves up for best success. Now, before we kick into the presentations, just some really quick housekeeping on webinar software. I've muted everyone's microphones, so if you can please not fiddle with that, it just means that there's no background noise that can disturb presenters. Uh, we will be having a question and answer session at the end of today after the presentation. If you would like to ask a question, you should see I, it will most likely be down the bottom of your screen, but it does look a little bit different to, from person to person, but you should see a little speech bubble icon somewhere. If you hit that, an option should appear to type in a question. Please make sure that you type that to everyone or send it to Birchip Cropping Group if you would like to send it to me anonymously. Um, and feel free to submit questions at any time, but we will be answering them all at the end of the session. Now this webinar is being recorded. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, if you're having any technical issues, or if you would like to share this with colleagues or peers, then the recordings will be made, made available on the GRDC website early next week. But if you would like it sooner than that, flick me an email and I can get you an early copy. Now, to help our presenters, I have two super quick questions that I'd like to ask you so we have a gauge on who's joining us in today. So, popping up on your screen, you should see two questions. One is just about a bit about yourself. So, are you a current Faber bean grower? Have you a long time or occasional? And the second one is about where you're located. So, if I can get you to quickly have a look at those, and answer some of those questions, that will give us a bit of a gauge in terms of who we've got. If you can't see it as well too, I apologise, but relax for a little bit longer. All right. Got quite a few agronomists on the line, quite a few miscellaneouses and quite a few long time bean growers. No occasional bean growers and no one thinking about it. Also got a few from the SA and Vic Mallee, from Wimmer and Central, uh, Central Vic, a few from Southern Vic and SA, so in the high rainfall zone there, and a couple from outside the GRDC Southern region. Beautiful, we'll close that off now. Thank you very much for participating in that. That gives us a good gauge. Now, let's get stuck into the content today. We're going to kick off with an agronomy update. And this will be from Dr. Jason Brand, who's with Agriculture Victoria based in Horsham. So Jason heads up the GRDC Southern Pulse Agronomy Program and has over 20 years experience in the pulse industry. Jason, I will unmute you and share the presentation. <coughs> Over to you. Thanks, Pro. I'm just waiting for the presentation to come up. Okay, so for my uh, presentation today, we'll just move on to the first slide there, Pro. Um, what uh, I've kept it relatively simple, um, a base outline of some of uh, almost like 101 uh, favour bean growing. Uh, we can talk more about some of the details and discuss a whole range of agronomic issues as uh, the webinar goes along. So this is uh, not a full-on presentation, you know, because obviously we could be talking for, you know, an hour or so if we wanted to talk about full-on agronomy in terms of beans. This is just an introduction, um, some of the base level stuff, and, um, you know, and then we can sort of expand on and have conversations about various levels of agronomy throughout. So this front slide um, just highlights a bit of what it was like last year. So this is down at Talangatuck in our high rainfall zone site. Um, fairly variable, highly acidic, um, very variable growth. 
um, but we'll talk a little bit more about yield in a couple of moments. So we'll flick on to the next slide. You're right there, Prue. Yep. And go another one. So I guess uh, if you take that second bit off, just so we can see the photos first. A bit jumpy here. So just in terms of the key things for us last year, obviously the dry and the frost, uh, frosty conditions were key drivers uh, in in the season on, that we had, particularly here in Vic. Obviously, there some areas that didn't get frosted, um, but most areas were generally drier than average. Uh, there were some very good areas, and you know, as I've highlighted there, some good bits. I remember walking out around Caniva and, and looking at beans and thinking, gee, this is amazing compared to what I'd seen through the areas that I run most of my trials, which is up, up from Horsham, up through Cario, um, and even to, to Chilangatuck to some extent, because uh, that site there struggled throughout the season. Yes, there were some good yields there. So if we flick on to the next bit. And I guess the key thing around beans, and we'll talk more about high prices later in the presentation, um, but obviously high prices really drove beans last year. Low disease pressure. And uh, we found we had fairly good grain quality uh, considering the season. Uh, and overlaying all that was the surprising yield. So even, even in our lower rainfall zone, and we're dealing with just over 100 mils growing season rainfall, uh, we were still yielding you know, 300 to 500 kilos of beans, which could have been quite profitable last year. And down here at Horsham, you know, half a tonne to a tonne, and Tlangatuck hit that two and a half to three and a half tonne mark. So, so given the season, uh, yields were amazing. And when you look at that photo there, it was quite amazing to see the yields that were coming off. It was certainly worthwhile harvesting across the board. So if we flick on to the next slide. I guess one of the key things is I want to draw back to the Tlangatuck site. And this will just touch on the acid soils. Yes, we have done some work with Ross Ballard. Uh, Ross has done some fantastic work with looking at these new inoculants and opportunities on some of the acid soils. The biggest thing that I'm hearing is obviously line your soils up, get them up above that five, five and a half range, um, and then we eliminate a, a lot of our rhizobial issues straight away. So uh, yeah, that was one of the key things that we're picking up. But there is certainly opportunities with some of these acid tolerant rhizobia. And so in this photo here, you can actually see uh, a plot that wasn't treated versus uh, something with acid tolerant rhizobia. And if we click on the next slide, you can see the level of nodulation at this particular site. And then across this site, uh, it was highly variable depending on uh, whether we got slightly waterlogged during the season. Uh, the pH of this site was around that 4.2 range. So uh, the grower has let that site get down very low. Uh, currently, he's going to be taking a number of his paddocks out of uh, pulse production until he brings them back up to around that five range. Uh, I was only just talking to him earlier this week. So he's going to be putting out significant amounts of lime this year uh, just to try and start bringing some of these paddocks up uh, and, and get them more usable for pulses. So let's click on to the next slide. So a quick snapshot into 2009 considerations, obviously pricing, and Francois will probably touch on that a lot more uh, coming on later in the presentation. Hi, Jason, we've just lost you momentarily. Can you repeat that bit? Are you there, Jason? You, yeah, Pro? Yeah, sorry, you were muted for a moment. Go, just start that bit again, please. Okay, disease issues. So obviously, uh, coming to a season like this one, the key disease issues, acid colour, chocolate spot, um, we're not going to touch a lot more on that. I'm not going to talk too much about disease and disease management. Uh, but there are ongoing opportunities around uh, new varieties and that moving forward, and we'll touch on that in the variety slide coming up in a moment. And on to weed management. Uh, and obviously, we know with all pulses, uh, you know, keep an eye out for herbicide residues in many areas. We have continued to have a relatively dry summer, so we potentially could have carryovers. Uh, I've certainly seen that group eye damage in the past. Uh, many times 
with babes. Uh, I had it last year in Horsham. I've had it down the southwest. I've had it up in the Mallee. So it's certainly a common problem, that montreal carryover with veins. Um, and then um, I just highlighted another photo down there. One thing that we often confuse with uh, disease is this oil, oil spotting we get with the grass sprays in crops. So just a couple of little things I wanted to touch on around weed management. Um, we'll jump straight into the next uh, slide, which talks about the um, potential new varieties or the new varieties that have been released. So coming up this season, we've got uh, two new varieties, PBO Marne, which is an earlier flowering option with adaptation to the lower rainfall short season, has done really well in South Australia particularly, uh, and uh, has done well in Victoria, but there's potentially other options coming through for the dry areas that it will be higher yielding again. It's generally a slightly above Bendock in our drier region. So it does have yield advantages in the shorter seasons, um, but it certainly does stand out in South Australia. Bendock is obviously an exciting one, and uh, obviously that first bean with improved tolerance to the, the any chemistry post-emergent herbicides. Um, there was hope that there may be a product registered for use later this year, but that might be on hold at this point of time talking to the companies involved in commercialising that. So there certainly will be a registered product in time uh, and that's a, a, an exciting option for PBA Bendoc. That photo there basically highlights what that registered product looks like in crop um, and will provide um, a good weed control option. Obviously we don't want to be relying on our group Bs but it does provide an option uh, both for residues and also in crop use. Uh, the good thing about Bendoc is it is resistant to aspic blight and yields similar to other varieties out there at this point of time. So we're certainly aware that uh, there is significant quantity of seed available. So we'd encourage people to make sure they've got all their seed orders in. Um, you know, Seednet have uh, made a big effort to make as much available as possible this year given the dry season we had last year. And um, as an industry, we're expecting relatively, up to, uh, re relatively rapid uptake with the uh, NDOC. We'll flick on to the next slide. And given the audience we've got on board, some of these questions are probably not even relevant, but um, I guess keys to successful beans. Uh, one of the first questions I always ask myself, um, even in trial work, is why am I growing this crop or why am I doing what I'm doing? So a real clear understanding, why am I growing this crop? Is it just purely about profitability or is it about a whole system response? And uh, those questions can certainly shape uh, the answers to several of the other uh, points marked below. I'm not going to go into any major depth here. We can continue the conversation later on, but think about, you know, why are we actually growing the crop? Is it just to make a profit? You might come in in a tough, um, into a tougher paddock there and, and you know, use the IMI technology on a tougher paddock um, to try and get a, a legume in there. But you might be setting up your farming system so that you can continuously grow um, pulses in there and you know contributing you know large amounts of nitrogen you've got sheep in your system so there's a whole range of uh, options there of why you might be growing the crop obviously paddock selection and management beans are probably one of the best ones going across a range of soil types uh, probably one of the more tolerant crops obviously to water logging but they also do uh, and go across a, quite a range of soil types. We've grown them quite well even on sandier type soils. They just run out of water in a lot of those drier regions where we've got our sandier type soils. So, so they're pretty well adapted to a range of soil types. Um, and you know, obviously thinking about your management up front. Crop and variety choice, we've touched on, on the variety choice uh, just, just before. Uh, obviously we've got a number of good varieties out there now and there's more varieties coming through. Some of the exciting options coming through is there's a, a line with improved disease resistance uh, that we're continuing to look at uh, in the breeding program and through the agronomy program. Uh, keep in mind the pre-emergent herbicides. I'm not going to go into any major detail here, but uh, there are a number of options out there now, uh, and it's really important that we get that right. 
because uh, obviously we want to give the crop the best start possible. Seed dressings and disease strategies, and this ties in with inoculants and nutrition. Uh, in terms of beans, in a lot of cases we don't put seed dressings on, but it's certainly a consideration. I know as part of the agronomy program, we, we quite often will use uh, gaucho and, and products like that, but that's within a, a research program where we're trying to prevent uh, the use of insecticides pretty early on. In terms of disease strategies, be prepared up front. Uh, really encourage everyone to order the chemistry up front um, and work with your, your local agronomist. You know, you, and Rowan will touch on this a lot more around the chemistry and, and the chemicals that we can use within beans and the opportunities going forward in a few moments' time. And then obviously uh, the big questions around inoculants. We really would encourage people to inoculate their beans, particularly on acid soils or even on some of the tougher soils if you, you're choosing to grow them in the mallee. Uh, yeah, so the double inoculation strategy has proved to work really well with just the peat-based products. So that's a good alternative at this point of time. Uh, until, say, an acid tolerant strain becomes available. Nutrition, there's lots of information out there. Obviously, you want to get your base, basal nutrition right. Uh, it's a broad area because obviously it's very dependent on your soil type and, and the environment you're in. Uh, but uh, obviously, making sure you've got your phosphorus there. We've seen phosphorus responses on a number of soil Jason, we've lost you there temporarily. Yeah, we just lost you again temporarily there. Where, where'd you lose me? Uh, about 30 seconds. Okay, I think I might come. Happy to discuss nutrition later on. So I was just moving on to seeding rate and uh, roast basing. Seeding rates, uh, beans are probably one of the more flexible crops in that. So based on a system that we might be using is around the 30 centimetres, 12 inch row spacing, seeding rates around that 20 plants per square metre are generally sufficient. On narrower row spacings, we generally find slightly higher seeding rates at 25 to 30 plants per square metre. Uh, and then at wider, wider row spacings, we can drop back to even down to 15 plants per square metre, um, provided that's what we're actually getting established. Uh, in crop and beans are pretty flexible in terms of row spacing. Uh, particularly here in Victoria, there's probably slightly different responses in South Australia. So it's important to understand it um, in your particular environment and the responses you may get there under the farming system that you're operating. And look at it not just from a yield perspective, but from an overall profitability perspective. And at the end of the day, really encourage everyone to um, be partnering closely with a good agronomist, someone who's really passionate about growing beans um, and willing to dig in, ask questions, search after things. Um, it's really important to have those partnerships at the end of the day. So I think that's uh, about it for me, Prue. I think that covers off. Beautiful, thank you, Jason. And um, remember to hit the speech bubble icon to type your questions in and we can ask them to Jason at the end of the formal presentation. I'm now going to introduce you to Dr. Rowan Kimber, who's a research scientist at Sardi's Pulse and Oilseed Pathology Group. And he's here to dig into some of the disease details that Jason, Jason was just touching on then. Rowan, over to you. Thanks very much, Prue, and uh, welcome to all your listeners. I appreciate you joining this webinar. I'll um, aim to just give a um, uh, the fundamental um, overview of FUB bean disease management. Uh, many of you, especially those that are long-time growers and agronomists, will be fairly familiar with a lot of it, but it's always good to revisit it, especially uh, this stage of the year as we consider going back in. So 
Um, really, just those dot points sort of outline a number of uh, outline a number of key points. Um, first of all, know your disease. I know it seems very a simple statement, but um, understanding a little bit about the symptoms, uh, a little bit of how the disease, uh, uh, where it comes from, how it spreads, and the conditions it does so, and I'll outline those a little bit. Um, but also just uh, the, the economic importance of those disease in your given regions because they do change from uh, region to region. So you, you have to determine which disease is the highest priority to manage. Uh, if you're out in the Mallee and you might have a, uh, a dry finish, then maybe botrytis is not so problematic, uh, whereas the cost for an ascochyta might be, whereas in the high rainfall uh, zones, then chocolate spot really is going to be um, is going to be a real sort of a game changer if, uh, if you get into an epidemic uh, in a wet spring. So uh, ideally, you really want to start your disease management as early as possible, and that starts now. So it really comes from variety selection and being prepared, uh, having the fungicide sitting in the shed for um, uh, when so you, they are available to you. Um, now, I, I know it doesn't look like it so much at the moment this year. Uh, we, we haven't had the opening rains and um, Forecasts might indicate um, something different at any given time, but uh, really be prepared for a long window of protection, certainly from the point of view of having the fungicides available to you, um, because we have had seasons where uh, those drawn out uh, spring rains have also run into problems with the availability of fungicide, and that, that has a direct impact on those trying to manage diseases, uh, getting the product that they want. Um, be prepared to alternate or switch fungicide chemistries. This is particularly important when you're managing botrytis, uh, where only a couple of applications of the main game, main um, fungicides are permitted. So you've got to be prepared to switch if you need to keep going. I'll outline that uh, shortly. Um, but also just really ensuring those sprays are economic. So um, in, the, in the case of, say, um, Ascochyta, late control uh, in a dry spring is just not going to be economic, or if you are constrained to uh, the lower yielding regions, then you've got to sort of uh, proportion that against the um, economic justification of putting out the fungicide. Um, Resistant varieties don't require the same uh, foliar fungicide program as susceptible ones. Uh, there's a lot of money goes into breeding and the idea there is to, to rely on it. So if you're selecting um, the most advanced uh, varieties with uh, resistance to um, diseases, particularly Ascochyta, then you can back off the fungicide applications that are targeting those and I'll outline that. But uh, most importantly, just keep up with registrations and permitted fungicides via the APVMI website. They do change from year to year. I'm just going to talk about the main players, not necessarily a lot of the other permitted ones because they change quite often. And you can always look at other information at, uh, at GRDC website or uh, Pulse Australia website for what I'm talking about here in greater detail. Next, thanks, Prue. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I've mentioned three diseases uh, already, Ascochyta, Chocolate Spot and Cercospora. They're all a bit different and they present differently as far as symptoms and they behave differently as far as a pathogen goes. So Ascochyta requires uh, frequent uh, rain events and, and particularly to establish in the May-July period uh, early on and, uh, and then going forward from that point. Um, ultimately, no rain um, means really no disease spread. Um, it uh, relies on that and so uh, those sort of, you can see that in the last uh, couple of years perhaps there have been many areas where Ascochyta hasn't been so much of a problem when you've had big gaps between rain events or a lack of spring rains. But there has been a, a shift in virulence of this pathogen and it's now established in South Australia and Victoria and that's changed uh, the resistance profiles of a number of the, uh, of the cultivars and I'll, I'll uh, discuss that. Um, chocolate spot, now that's, uh, that really requires uh, sort of warmer conditions, so start getting outside of, outside of winter, uh, that 15, 25 degree range and humid conditions and humid doesn't necessarily mean tropics, humid just means bulky canopies that are uh, holding soil moisture well and creating a microclimate that's favourable. So, but it normally starts around about August and I'll just draw your attention to the flowers there. I specifically put that there because when it comes to disease identification for chocolate spot, 
uh, look to the flowers as a good indicator as to whether you're looking at chocolate spot versus the other disease. It's the only disease which will cause that spotting you see on flowers and it really attacks them. So use that as a good indicator as a diagnostic tool as to whether you're looking at chocolate spot. Just bear in mind that once you get sort of dry and windy conditions, the disease will just stop dead in its tracks with chocolate spot. So um, while most of you don't want that in spring, it will mean that the disease doesn't like it either. Okay, with Cercospora, this will probably be the first disease you will see in your crop. It's very early to establish, it likes the cold. And that early period around that grass spray uh, is the most critical for a, a fungicide application. And I'll detail that in a bit more um, with to which one, which would be Teviconazole, but really that's the window you want to aim at. And it is linked to a rotation, so long-time growers will be familiar with Cercospora that might have been established certainly in years past. Thanks, Prue. Okay, just a quick one about uh, 101 identification between the three diseases, the three main players. Ascochyta you'll see on the left, and you can see in the middle of those lesions there's lots of those little little pinprick dots. That is a, an absolute classic presentation for Ascochyta. They're the fruiting bodies where all the spores are generated from and that's pretty typical to see as, as to is that running lesion. You can see that the moisture running off those lesions have caused that sort of blighting and a running pattern down the leaf, particularly with gravity. Um, whereas with chocolate spot, it starts as this peppering chocolate spot um, and then uh, conditions as they become favourable starts blighting the parts of the leaf. So they start to coalesce and cause those larger brown lesions. Um, but uh, you don't see the pycnidia like you do in Ascochyta. So that's the main distinguishing feature. As too with, choc with Cercospora on the right there, while that looks similar to Ascochyta, just see that in the middle of those lesions, you just don't see any of those fruiting bodies there. You can, if you angle it nicely with the sun early in the morning, you might see some grey hair-like structures sticking up, very, very short ones. They're, they're the spores, and that can be useful as an ID as well for Cercospora. Thanks, Prue. Next. Okay, um, as I've sort of mentioned, Ascochyta, it... Uh, the susceptible varieties will uh, need an early fungicide application in those favourable areas, um, but uh, potting is certainly at the other end of the season maybe maybe necessary on on some of the partially compromised uh, varieties, and I'll I'll just detail those ones shortly. But um, uh, that's where uh, if if you're getting the spring conditions for the disease to keep going. Chlorothalonil, chlorothalonil and mancozeb are really the best actives for uh, ascochyta blight and the main players for control and for effective control at that. Whereas Cercospora is very much, um, is tebiconazole is the preferred product, particularly it is a cheaper product. Carbendazem is also effective, but I'd be keeping that in the shed until you need it for chocolate spot rather than burn it early for Cercospora leaf spot. So, but the critical window is that six to eight weeks after sowing. So when you're thinking of going out onto the paddock to control the grass um, or you know, put out your herbicide application, that's also the time you want to be putting out tebiconazole to just stop that Cercospora being established. And uh, those of you who are familiar with farber bean growing, uh, would probably have seen Cercospora and are most likely using this tebiconazole spray. And it sets you up very well because it does have indirect control over other diseases such as chocolate spot and rust. So um, that's also another bonus for it to be useful for that early application. Um, with chocolate spot, the big critical thing is to spray your uh, carbenism or persimidone before canopy closure at that early flowering stage, but certainly before canopy closure, because once that's closed, that window's shut. Uh, and then follow-up sprays, dependent on seasonal varieties. Um, and as I said, carbenism and prismidone are the best ones for this. Um, now, rust and sclerotinia are very much kind of uh, seasonal influenced, um, but uh, rust will have some uh, tebiconazole, tebiconazole will have some uh, indirect effect there and then you can it will be controlled generally when mancozeb and chlorothalonil will put out and uh, sclerotinia likewise with prosimetone. Thanks, Bree. Okay, just an update on the, the virulence change with Ascochyta blight. Many of you might have been um, aware that it has changed uh, since around about 2013. There hasn't been any update in changes since 2015. Uh, there are two pathotypes 
uh, that we have identified. Um, if you were growing fab beans 10 years ago, uh, you would not have. Uh, we wouldn't be having this discussion. It was pretty much uh, one pathotype seemed to be doing the damage. That was an older, an older sort of Ascochyta reaction group, and that's the most widely established. And, and all commercial commercial varieties except Fiesta are res resistant to that. However, the game change uh, there has been a big change in since 2013. Uh, the newer uh, reaction group pathotype two is now established in uh, most of South Australia, excluding the Eyre Peninsula, um, and in Victoria. Farrah and Fiesta are, are now uh, behave the same against this pathotype, so Farrah is susceptible, whereas there's a partial compromise of PBA Rana, PBA Zara, and PBA Marn. And uh, now on that photo on the right, that's actually uh, PBA Rana. You can see very clearly those lesions on the pods, and that's really probably the probably that, that, that end of the season that you really need to be careful of these partial resistant changes because you want to protect those pods. Uh, whereas Nura, PBA Samira and PBA Bendock are resistant to this. So uh, you're good to go there. Next, thanks, Prue. Okay, this is a little bit of a logic schematic. I know it looks a bit busy, but it's kind of, I guess, how the human mind works in a way when you try to compartmentalise how you might tackle the season. Just down the left, you've got the diseases. Uh, and then across the bottom, you've basically got time, starting from uh, seeding all the way through to harvest, uh, and that arrow indicates that. And so what I'm trying to do here and what we've done here at Sardi is to just try to present this in a little bit of a logical manner. So if you are growing a, a susceptible variety, you'd be sitting up on that top blue band to, um, to these diseases, and therefore you are, are going to be... Um, well, it's it's broken up into the different diseases. So uh, rust first. That's more of a northern region. So we'll concentrate um, on the Cercospora, Ascochyta, and chocolate spot, which are those lower bands. So looking at say, um, uh, if you were growing susceptible variety like Farrah or Fiesta to in a um, in that lower part of that sort of um, pale band there, you can see you're up for quite a few applications of fungicides in that S and MS because you're putting a, um, an early one out to that, mid, that July period or June, then you're going again in August to, if Ascochyta persists and then you're going again um, in potting if the, we're getting a wet spring. So you contrast that with if you've selected a resistant or a moderately resistant variety above it and those first couple of ones are missed and you're really just potentially looking at potting if we're getting a, a wet spring and you've got Ascochyta present, present. Whereas if you look at, say, chocolate spot down the bottom, uh, there's not a lot of activity you're specifically doing in the way of in-crop uh, fungicide applications early on because the real business end is that canopy closure and flowering and potting and that's where that's really where you've got to concentrate your efforts to control this disease a lot of it's dri driven by wet soils so if you're getting the rain to wet up the soils and hold that microclimate of humidity in the crop then that's where you want to uh, be concentrating those applications to uh, get you through that next thanks Bruce. Uh, and this just really outlines what I've already said uh, with the different diseases, the different uh, uh, fungicides. You can see there is overlap uh, a little bit between them, but uh, specifically pick your disease and, uh, and look at, uh, um, uh, in some cases, look at maybe mixes with uh, Carbenazem mancozeb if you're straddling that window uh, of early Ascochyta control, but wanting to get uh, something out around canopy closure. Um, but uh, down the bottom with uh, Cercospora, it's sort of tepiconazole alone early, and that's your main window of protection. Um, and after that, you've, uh, you've done your dash and, and you've probably got it under control using that early spray. Next, thanks, Bruce. I just, these next couple of slides are probably just uh, optimistically looking forward and how the, um, the bean breeding program has always looked for dual resistance. We, while we look at diseases in isolation, ideally growers want to have a, a um, varieties which can cope with both, uh, and we're getting there. So if you look at uh, a lot of the coloured dots, they're all the current varieties that you'd be familiar with, plus the few of the new ones. Whereas if you look at those green dots, they're the most advanced material we're getting in the currently in the NVT program, and uh, and thankfully they're congregating down that bottom left hand corner, and that's where they're getting low ratings to Ascochyta blight and lower ratings for a chocolate spot. And that's fairly exciting because um, that represents uh, ultimately dual resistance. And if we go to the next slide, 
you'll see how that translates into yield. So chocolate spot, um, this is yield against chocolate spot um, rating severity. And again, those uh, a lot of the varieties are familiar to you all. The, um, the good news is that you can see that uh, angled um, uh, uh, angled sort of negative relationship. The higher the chocolate spot ratings, the lower the yield is. So if you again look at the, the left upper left hand corner, there's a um, um, there's a couple of green dark green dots there, and that's the new variety, which is probably only about a year away, and that is uh, potentially going to give us a a really good change for chocolate spot resistance, um, uh, unlike what we've seen in any of the other varieties, as well as of our Ascochyta resistance. And in this case, this was uh, data from Freeling in 2016. You can see that they were, that those variety that variety yielded uh, four and a half ton, and that was without any application of fungicide at all. So we are looking forward, and uh, and optimistically so, with some a good variety coming through. Okay, yeah, just move to the last one. Thanks, Prue. That'd be good. Um, we do want to monitor what's going on in regards to diseases, particularly the change in ascotter blight. So we would welcome any of you to submit samples through uh, that, not just for faba beans, but also lentils and chickpeas. Uh, you can do so uh, through Sarah Blake. Um, there's details there, or um, uh, you can even, uh, if you email her or call her, she can give you some um, uh, labelled envelopes and, and post back uh, for, to receive those. So we'd certainly appreciate that. We do like to monitor what's going on so we can keep you up to date. Thanks, Prue. Thank you very much, Rowan. Very much appreciated. All right. Last but certainly not least, is we're going to get have a marketing update, which is something that's quite topical with favour beans at the moment. So I'd like to introduce Francois Darkus, who operates his own pulse trading business, AgriOz Exports, and he brings a wealth of international trade experience. Francois, I will just hit your button and yep. you should be right to go. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. All right. Um, yes, yeah, so good morning, all. Um, I think it's a good time to discuss marketing because we've, in the, in the space of 48 months, two years, we've seen uh, two extremes. We've seen a very large crop in 16, 17. Uh, Australian crop was probably a bit over 600,000 tons. And then we saw prices go very, very low, as many of you will recall, uh, because they had to find uh, outlets in feed markets. Uh, and that's because the export market is pretty finite. Uh, you don't mind going to the next slide, Pro? Um, and then if you take, you zoom forward to this year where the Australian crop is forecast or estimated at around 200,000 tons uh, by bears in Perth, Australia, uh, you've seen prices go to the other extreme. Uh, I think we've traded for quite a significant time prices of $1,100 delivered port. Uh, so you, you've really seen the full spectrum of prices there. And, uh, and that is explained by uh, the fact we have a very narrow market on the export side for fiber beans. Uh, what I'm showing on this slide here is where most of the fiber beans from Australia are exported to. Top line is Egypt. And Egypt, pretty much every year, no matter what uh, the crop size is, takes about 70% of our exports. Uh, so pretty much when Egypt sneezes, well, uh, our market sneezes here too. Uh, the other thing about Egypt and the other market is that they will buy more if the price is low, as you can see in the column for 1617, where we managed to export 330,000 tons, as opposed to maybe 150,000 tons that we will reach this year. But they will only buy more if the price is really very, very cheap because it has to displace other products and other origins, favor beans in their market. Um, other than Egypt, uh, the regular markets are Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, which is more of a broad bean market, but for statistical purposes, the uh, favor beans and broad beans are always aggregated. United Arab Emirates, Lebanon. So it, it, as you can see, it, it's pretty much a uh, Middle Eastern destination market. Um, next slide, please. So 
So looking at Egypt specifically, uh, Australia has generally enjoyed a very good uh, market share in Egypt, uh, and that's due to the quality of our favorite beans, which are uh, much appreciated. They have a nice color normally in a good year. They split well, uh, and that gives them generally a price premium of anywhere from $20 a ton to $100, $150 a ton uh, in, in tight years. Our competition traditionally has been France, the UK, and, and more recently the Baltic. So that's mostly Lithuania, but some other smaller countries nearby. You can see on that slide that French exports have pretty much come to a halt uh, since uh, 15, 16, 16, 17. And that is purely due to the local environmental authorities forbidding um, some insecticide. I'm not sure which one, I don't know the name, but pretty much with that insecticide being forbidden, uh, growers are not able to produce faber beans that are suitable for human consumption. They have a serious insect problem, and so they've lost that market share in Egypt. But markets are funny. There is always, a, there's never a vacuum for very long. So as France stopped exporting, uh, we saw uh, a new production in the Baltic, which is really competing very hard with Australia. Uh, they are producing a pretty good quality bean and uh, their productions have been increasing, except for 1819, as you can see in that green column, um, it's sort of a perfect storm for Faber Beans market internationally, where every origin at Poor crops. We we have a crop uh, this year that's probably the smallest in more than 10 years. Uh, the same happened in the UK and, and the Baltic also suffered a very hot summer and uh, much reduced yields. So that slide, uh, the green column to the right again, explains the, the extraordinary prices uh, we've seen in the last several months, uh, where Egypt has gotten used to importing up to 600,000 tons a year from three or four origins. This year, they, they won't find 400,000 tons, or if, if they do, it will just be that. So the, as favorites are pretty much a staple food in Egypt, the, the price has reacted accordingly. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I mentioned the market is pretty narrow. It's pretty much the Middle East and then some Asian destinations for broad beans. Uh, there's some hope that China will become a market. Uh, there is interest from Chinese importers, and that has been there for several years uh, for our favorite beans. Uh, there is a roadblock there, which is that there is no phytosanitary protocol between China and Australia for favorite beans and, and for many other agricultural products. Uh, so there is some work being done there by GMF to try to uh, get the two governments to agree on something and then open that Chinese market. Uh, so what we have seen in the last several years is some indirect exports. So some Chinese buyers will buy uh, into Vietnam and then probably smuggle the product across the border. But that's not a, it's a fairly cumbersome way to get the product into China. So the day we can import, export directly to China, that would provide some balance to our market because we will not depend purely on the Middle Eastern demand and Egyptian demand and, uh, and China as a scale to become a major market. Uh, again, at a price, the Chinese are very uh, astute buyers and they will buy favor beans uh, when they compare well to other products they can buy. They will use fabrins for the starch uh, in the production of vermicelli noodle uh, and also in fish farming and also in food uh, food markets. Uh, so let's hope this happens soon. But from what I understand, it's not a top priority for either government. There are other products that are uh, more prioritized uh, in terms of getting into uh, to China. So uh, what can we expect for this coming year uh, in terms of prices? The, the prices we've seen this year are probably going to create an increase in acreage in Europe and here. Um, if in Europe conditions are pretty good at the moment and, and uh, both the UK and, and the Baltic 
are already starting to sell new crop shipments. So their harvest is in September, so just two, three months before ours. So they're already selling some shipments, October shipments, at much, much reduced prices, which indicate they have pretty strong confidence about their next crop. Uh, so to give an idea of the prices that have traded into Egypt for that the new crop uh, from Europe, that would be the equivalent of a Australian dollars 350 delivered port, delivered Melbourne or Adelaide say, for shipment and containers. Uh, we would generally extract a premium for Australian favorites, but you can see that even if we got to say a $50 premium, we're talking maybe $400 delivered port, uh, which is uh, not at all the same as what we, we have seen recently with prices uh, north of $1,000 a ton. Uh, but that's what we can expect, assuming uh, there's also an area growth here in Australia, which I would expect given uh, recent prices. But obviously, the, the weather would be a big factor in that. We'll need a bit of a rain soon to get some confidence and then a better growing season than last year to get back to uh, better yields and then a larger crop. So, yeah, so the weather is going to be a, a huge factor, obviously, but uh, on on balance, I don't think we can expect to see the prices would just so again, unless there was another crop break, not only here, but also in Europe. And, and the probability of that is fairly low. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so that's just to give you an idea of the, the market share of Australian favor beans in uh, in Egypt, uh, so Australia there is in uh, purple, then you have France and the UK, and then more recently the Baltic in, in dark blue. So you can see our, our market share is relatively constant, and when it is much lower, it is really uh, a function of uh, production problem here. So we we had droughts here in the mid late uh, 2000s and fairly small feather crops from. Uh, or six or seven onwards, uh, it didn't really recover until 10, 11. Um, but, and then you can see in 16, 17, when we had a huge crop and fairly cheap prices, then our market buy and market share went a little bit over 50%. Uh, next slide, please. So same uh, chart about market shares. Um, and so you can see we, we can, with a good crop, but lower prices, we can achieve a 50% market share in, in Egypt. Uh, obviously, we don't control that 100%. It also depends on what other countries do. And one possibility after this year's uh, very high prices is that we will see possibly new origins. Uh, we could see some competition emerge from maybe the Ukraine. We have seen some shipments from Ethiopia of all places to Egypt. Uh, because Ethiopia apparently traditionally grows faber beans, but are normally consume, consuming in, uh, themselves, but when the prices reach uh, such level, then they, are, they become exporters. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, the, this slide and the next one is to give you an idea of what, what your favor beans look like uh, once they're in uh, consumers' hands in Egypt. So that's a traditional Egyptian dish called uh, full medames, where the favors are uh, cooked in sort of a spicy onion and tomato sauce. And uh, it, it's a breakfast food. It's uh, very, very filling. Um, and that's very traditional food in Egypt. So most Egyptian families will eat that for breakfast. Next slide. And then something you are probably more familiar with, falafel. We can see a lot of those here in Australia. Uh, so favorites are split first to achieve that and sort of ground into a very coarse flour, and that's how you make falafel, and that's also very traditional food in, uh, in Egypt. So that's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Francois. Now, we'll move into the Q&A section. Just a reminder that if you do want to type in a question, look for that little speech bubble that I've outlined in red on your screen there. We've only had one question come in through at this stage, which Jason has already answered through the chat function. So thank you very much, Jason, but I'll just quickly read that out for people who might not have seen it. The question was, 
will double rate of peat inoculation give you longer survival in dry soil? And Jason has responded with potentially yes, as you are increasing the overall numbers of rhizobia. It worked well for us at the dry zone, high rainfall zone site last year. Um, please feel free to type in your questions while I'm giving you a few moments to do that. Um, if you're looking for further information on favour beans, uh, then the GRDC Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource that you can access through their website, which has a lot of details based on all, uh, some of the work that both Jason and Rowan have done, plus a lot of be uh, favour bean work right across the industry, and it's an incredibly comprehensive and useful resource. Additionally, um, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project, which we're bringing you these webinars through, will have a number of activities occurring through 2019 to continue bringing you all the latest in pulse information. We have a series of pulse check groups, which are discussion groups that are looking at new growers of pulses. Um, and those locations there are on your screen. If you are near one of these locations and would like to get involved, click me an email. I'll have my contact details at the end of this webinar and I'll get you in touch with the group coordinator. Um, Roy has just put through another question, which Jason, it's another inoculation question, so I'll unmute you. But can you apply inoculation to dry seed? All right, I'm unmuted. Uh, well, obviously, the, um, the peat-based product is applied as a slurry to dry seed. Um, and, you know, often, well, that's probably the simplest answer. Uh, so, yeah, you can't, you don't apply the, the peat-based product um, to the seed without first putting it into a slurry. Obviously, there's other options with the granular inoculants, but I realise that there's potential shortages of many of those granular products this year. Thanks, Jason. Still opportunity to get questions in if you would like. In addition to the Pulse Check group, we'll be having a series of crop walks at Southern Pulse Agronomy trial sites right across the region, so look out for details of those heading into late winter and spring. Um, there's also more Pulse webinars this week, so there'll be one on vetch and one on field peas tomorrow, and one on lentils and one on chickpeas on Friday, and we're still trying to lock in a lupin webinar for people who are interested in lupins, so keep an eye out on GRDC social media and events pages for getting that one finalised. Um, if you did like today's um, webinar, if it, if it works, if you like the format, if you like not having to get in the car, even though there's sometimes some minor technical issues, um, and you know, you think this is a good way to find out about pulses, please let me know and we can look at perhaps doing some more in-depth webinars on different pulse topics throughout the growing season this year. Uh, we're also looking at putting out a number of communication products, so resources for you throughout the year that will make sure that we can keep delivering you the most relevant information as it comes to hand. We haven't had any other questions in and I'm pretty mindful that we are very close to time. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring today's webinar to a close. A great big thank you to all of our presenters, Jason, Rowan and Francois today. Very much appreciated. And I also really appreciate all of you for having the time to join in today. Thanks for your time and I hope that you all grow magnificent bean crops this season.